It's a pleasure and an honor to introduce Professor Catherine Odar. She is a visiting fellow at the Department of Philosophy at the London School of Economics, uh, where uh, she has been teaching political and moral philosophy <clears throat> since the 90s. She is well known for his uh, exploration uh, of uh, uh, John Rawls' uh, work, uh, and uh, she wrote uh, what is, in my view, the best available introduction uh, to the so-called first roles. And uh, I li would like to remember that she is the French translator of uh, A Theory of Justice, and uh, her interests concern a variety of normative issues uh, in political theory with special reference to citizenship, uh, respect, responsibility, liberalism. Uh, Odard's contribution to the conference uh, concerns a critical analysis of freedoms, certainly a basic European value uh, about which we don't reflect never enough. Uh, so uh, I will leave uh, the floor to Professor Odard, and after uh, her speech, uh, the discussant will be Andreas Niederberger of the University of Duisburg, Essen. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Right, thank you very much for the organizers to, for this invitation, which is uh, um, fascinating, really, because uh, uh, being faced with such a big question, freedoms, I was really puzzled. And uh, yes, yeah, sure, yes. I'm sorry, I have a cold, so my voice is not <laughs> terribly good, but I will do my best. I would like to start with, like that? Is that better? Is that, is that okay now? No. no. <laughs> I get closer to... No, no, it's all right. No, 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 it's... I think it should be, it should be fine now, yes. Okay, so let's... Uh, I would like to start with uh, reminding us of a bit of European history, because Philips asked what is European about <laughs> our meeting, and uh, 30 years ago, nearly by the day, on August 19th, 1989, citizens of Central and Eastern Europe under communist rule started to vote with their feet, crossing forbidden borders and flooding into the so-called free world. How do the so-called European freedoms stand in respect to these tremendous aspirations? I mean, uh, you. I'm sure some of you have still the memories of this huge movement of people across the borders. So, and they were driven by what Hegel described as the struggle for, uh, the universal struggle for freedom. So it, it's an image nobody in Europe can forget. So how do the so-called European freedoms stand in respect to these tremendous aspirations? is a union of law-governed, prosperous countries held together by shared values and interests, still as attractive as it was in 1989. Are the dignity, security, prosperity, and legality taken for granted in the union still holding, in spite of recent historical and political developments? Are not many political, economic, and moral weaknesses still unfixed, threatening the very survival of the Union? The main values and norms of the European Union, short of a constitution and a Bill of Rights, are enshrined in the European Charter and in many uh, legal uh, treaties, etc. But they are also present in the famous four freedoms expressed in the Treaty of Rome in 19, of 1950 and omnipresent during the Brexit negotiations and debates, 
freedom of movement for goods, services, capital and labor, and then citizens, quote. One cannot fail to be struck by a feeling of inconsistency and of conflicting strategies when one takes a closer look at both lists of freedoms. I must say, when I started thinking about this paper, I was really uh, struggling. How can you adjust these four freedoms, which are claimed all the time in Europe, and uh, a list of freedoms as in the European Charter? My aim in this paper, as a political and moral philosopher, not a specialist of the EU, of course, will be first to scrutinize these inconsistencies and the, co the conception of the person, of the agent, de derived from, and second, to provide an alternative, more coherent moral vision that could add to the legitimacy of the Charter at a time of growing dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction sorry, and so-called democratic deficit. So let's start with a point of vocabulary. Freedom is not the same as liberty. And usually, constitutionalists, political philosophers talk of liberty. That is, the possibility to act, think, work, move around within the boundaries fixed by law. That is, without unlawful interferences. Liberties and rights are synonymous in a rule-based political context with corresponding duties to abide by the law. Liberty is freedom within the law. The main question being, of course, who makes the law? But still, we have a concept which is uh, manageable. Freedom, however, is a much wider concept. And it's interesting, I mean, I was talking with Alessandra earlier, that in the 17th century, the term freedom was widely used. It's only in the 19th century that liberty became um, a, a competitive uh, concept. I, I would never um, strike a very uh, strong distinction between the two, but I just want to draw your attention to the, the, the tension here. So, Freedom is a much wider concept linked to human agency. It's a property of human agency. Its realm, its scope, and its limits. It is important then to remind ourselves that to define freedom as the ability to do as we please is as thoughtless, and I quote Spinoza here, an infant believing that of its own free will, it desires milk. An angry child believes that it freely desires to run away, etc. So freedom is not the ability to do as we please, because it's connected to agency and what is possible. What can we do? That's really the main question. Unfortunately, this view that freedom is the ability to do as we please is shared by libertarians that any interference with individual choices and desires is an interference with their sovereignty, and that the human person being described as an island has no responsibilities or duty towards others. This leads to envisioning market freedoms as the ultimate form of freedom in democracies. Even in less extreme versions, the dominant view of freedom in liberal democracies, as exemplified in the European Court of Human Rights itself, has put more emphasis on civil and political freedom than on socioeconomic rights. Let's call the former freedom to and the latter freedom from. My argument being that the two are tightly connected, emancipation being at once individual and collective. Freedom too, without taking any account of real social economic possibilities, conditions and obstacles for individual agency and choices, that is freedom from, is an empty word. If we agree that freedom is not the ability to do as we please, 
The main task, thus, is to understand and scrutinize the scope and limitations of our actions. So there's no uh, way we can understand freedoms without thinking about limits, coercion, uh, etc. So the two are absolutely connected. Uh, freedom is inseparable from existing conditions for agency. It is an exercise concept, I quote uh, Charles Taylor here. Freedom doesn't exist at a, as a simple possibility or aim, but relies on multifaceted conditions for action, policies, interventions, etc. It measures re a relationship between facts and values, a tension between facts and values. The difficulty is that these conditions are constitutive of freedom itself. Freedom in this sense is just freedom from, freedom from unlawful or unjust obstacles to agency. So it's only then that the definition of freedom as the capacity to act according to one's ends and I quote Charles Taylor again, to exercise control over one's life is meaningful. This is why you often, we often talk about freedom too as a positive freedom, but not in the sense of Isa Berlin, certainly not. Freedom in that sense is connected to a certain conception of the person as individual, autonomous, active, able to choose and develop her own aims and values against political, social, and cultural constraints, but also to accept, when justified, certain responsibilities and limitations on the scope, means, and consequences of her action. That's why I said that constraints are part and parcel of the concept of freedom. We, we can't really um, eliminate the tension. Citizens are free, I quote John Rawls here, citizens are free in that they conceive of, the, of themselves and of one another as having the moral power to form, revise, and rationally pursue a conception of the good, to regard themselves as self-authenticating um, sources of valid claims, and as capable of taking responsibility for their ends. So you see the, the tension between the conditions and the free uh, Freedom is, is there, I mean, all the time. So that's why uh, examples of people choosing to migrate after 1989 and uh, the opening of, the Western, of Western Europe to the previous communist countries would be a humbling test for the ideal of freedom as freedom too. Is it not highly hypocritical to talk about free choice or freedom of movement when no one from these countries would freely choose to remain or to move, um, to remain in their country. So the choice doesn't exist. The iron law of labor markets and uh, has prevailed and dictated choices. So is it then possible to uh, reconcile freedom to and freedom from? And here I would like to um, base my analysis on a forgotten British philosopher, but who I, I admire a lot, T.H. Green, who really tried to put together all these tensions. And I think the, the package is complex, but uh, without a complex view of freedom, uh, I think we can't talk about European values because we come from a complex background. And all these uh, different strands are, uh, are there. And we have to deal and uh, keep that uh, richness, if you want. He says, freedom is a positive power or capacity of doing and enjoying something worth doing and enjoying. And something that we do or enjoy in common with others. We mean by it a power which each man exercises, each human being, should say, exercises through the help or security given him by his fellow men and which he helps in turn to secure for them. The mere removal of compulsion, the mere enabling of a man to do as he likes is in itself no contribution to true freedom. That's in um, 
Liberal Legislation and Freedom of Contract, 1888, T.H. Green. Um, he is a representative of a kind of social liberalism, which is really uh, trying to put together all the trends of the European tradition, the liberal, the uh, social, the republican, uh, they all come together. If we keep these four factors, agency, an agent is free only if she can act and realize her objectives, so agency, values, the aim, the choice must be valuable, if not, why choose it? Choose it. Values, so freedom is a moral concept at the service of a co implying a conception of the good. Power, the agent is free if she's not subjected to arbitrary ways, but only, let's say, to the rule of law. So freedom is a political and legal concept. And solidarity, our freedom is absolutely dependent on the behavior of others. Their domination, we talked about equality earlier, but the domination that inequality uh, provides, I mean, uh, permits, is really the, and one of the main obstacles to freedom, of course. So freedom is a social concept. So I'm really uh, sticking to my guns here because I think this complex view of freedom with all these layers is typical of our European heritage. I mean, uh, uh, you would find the emphasis put on community in other countries or solidarity. Um, I live both in France and Britain, and the contrast is enormous. I mean, in France, you will always uh, give priority to the collective dimension of freedom, whereas in Britain, it's, of course, the individual dimension. So you see, I, I think uh, the package I propose is European in the sense that it is complex. So my main criticism, really, here, looking at the European Charter, and my main concern is how to clarify whether all these various ambitions, all these layers of the European concept of freedom are not disconnected and reduced in the end to a mostly economic view of freedom and prosperity. And if its understanding of freedom from is not too poor and restricted, is it enough to derive, to define, sorry, freedom from as solely freedom from want? Or should we not, could we not go beyond an ideal of sufficiency, what is enough uh, to uh, fight uh, poverty, want, etc., to go beyond and aim instead at a richer ideal of equal for, uh, freedom for all to realize their aims, their ambitions? where freedom from and freedom to are inextricably connected, as in uh, T.H. Green proposals. And I quote Rawls again here, and I think that's, um, uh, you mentioned uh, Samuel Moyne earlier, and I think it's absolutely <laughs> the same idea here. The idea is not simply to assist those who lose out through accident or misfortune, although this must be done, but instead to put all citizens in a position to manage their own affairs and to take part in social cooperation on a footing of mutual respect under appropriate equal conditions. So the idea is agency, to be able to act, you know, to, to stand on your feet and uh, look after yourself. So that's, um, that's the go beyond, in that way we go beyond uh, the limited or sufficient conditions for, uh, for freedom. We give it a positive sense, if you want, as a project, a capacity to act. This leads me to my major criticism that the list of freedoms included in European treaties, convention charters, show no awareness of the tensions and contradictions between socioeconomic freedoms and personal and political cultural freedoms. There is no um, mention of any priority like uh, the priority of political uh, liberties or freedoms that, that are indispensable to give freedom uh, content, some value, some, some worth. The thinking simply appears, I'm sorry about the caricature, but to have been free markets, 
for capital goods, services, and labor, the latter becoming citizens, you move from workers to citizens at the stroke of the pen, will lead to political freedom and democracy. And I think that's really the, the failure here, the, really the, um, the weak point. And that prosperity is the key to the union and its success. I remember I was in China in 1989, just before Tiananmen Square. And I, we were talking with students and uh, talking about democracy, what they were expecting for democracy, more freedom, and they say prosperity will be richer. And it's true that, <laughs> that the meaning for them of freedom was really freedom of enterprise, freedom of market, etc. I mean, it was clear. So, uh, 1989 in China. I don't know if they were under the influence of uh, the Western world, probably, but that was their immediate response, democracy, egal prosperity. This um, underlying belief is at work in the list of the four freedoms. So uh, it was really the ambition of the founding fathers of the Union. Free markets and le doux commerce, Montesquieu, would bring prosperity, peace, and democracy. That would be the, the connection. And when you look at the euro, I mean, it was the same reasoning that economic changes will lead to political and cultural changes, which, of course, doesn't work that way. So, um, so that's my, my point here, that there is a, a kind of a reduction of freedom and freedoms to economic freedoms and to a, view, a, a reduction of the view of the self in utilitarian terms. I mean, as um, so, I won't develop here, but I will. I mean, the, basically, the, my argument is that we should be aware of this uh, predominant view and see how it fits with a more Kantian either liberal or republican uh, vision of freedom as autonomy and self-development, which is present in the 1948 Declaration of Human Rights or in Roosevelt's address of the four freedoms. And I was struck because uh, Roosevelt in uh, 1941 talks about four freedoms, but f freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, freedom from fear not much to do with the four freedoms of the European Union. So the contrast is interesting. And the contrast was noted by Rawls when he wrote to Philip in his letter um, in 1998. And he described the European Union as, a, uh, as an open market uh, and um, who is animated by the move by the idea of economic growth onwards and upwards. And uh, the long term would be a civil society awash in a meaningless consumerism of some kind. So he was really describing the European Union in those terms. Contrasting, I'm sure, in his mind with uh, Roosevelt's 1941 uh, declaration that address. So I have three criticisms. The first is the, commodi the commodification of freedom, freedom as a commodity. And the collision between free markets and fundamental liberties that the so-called four freedoms lead to. Here it is obvious, and I, I won't develop, but here it is obvious that the aim of creating a uni uni unified Europe, sorry, around the main values of utility maximizing and prosperity has blinded the authors of the charter to the danger of utilitarian conception of the person. As it is a view that leads to sacrificing the rights of a minority if that increases the general or average well-being of the population. A striking illustration would be the loss of its educated elites through immigration that freedom of movement for labor has caused to many countries in Europe. Uh, but the balance is changing, but it's clear that, for instance, Romania has lost 50% of its educated elite. Ah, that's really the price to pay for prosperity, etc. I mean, 
in Britain, we have masses of people coming from Eastern or Central Europe, and they have contributed to the prosperity of the country at the loss, at the loss for the um, original country. So the unbalance here is really one of the factors also in the Brexit, I mean, obviously. So the, far from being morally neutral, free markets are destroying the weaker part, parties in the bargain. People enter into these four freedoms on a very unequal bargaining terms. I'm not attacking markets here, but I'm really criticizing the lack of regulation, structure, provisions for these huge movements of population. In the case of Britain, it was obvious that uh, we opened the borders, but there, was, there were never enough policies or preparations for this, um, the welcoming all this population. I mean, it's, it was just uh, people were trusting the market forces to uh, solve the problems. But the preparations or the provisions for uh, integrating these populations are, were very poor. And again, I think in, uh, in my view, it's one of the causes, the causes of Brexit. So do we want a market society? Do we want the European societies to be market societies where everything is for sale? and where the losers are left to their own devices. So it would be useful, I mean, uh, I don't know about studies uh, that field, but it would be useful to check on the decommodification score of the European Charter. How much do the European freedoms work towards treating people as persons, not as simply workers? Uh, there is a mention of that in the book by um, Esping Anderson. But I think, I'm sure there must be some research on that. So that's my first criticism. The second one is even more uh, worrying. It's the privatization of freedom. The conception, the dominant conception of freedom is as a, uh, a private, uh, private agency. And the impoverishment of public life that, and that such a list of freedoms generates. If there are two points here. The, if the dominant accepted values are prosperity and economic growth, then there's not enough space for public debates on alternative views when other objectives, such as justice, equality, or the protection of the environment could be argued for. A dominant conception of the good, such as the, as the utilitarian one, crowds out the public space, making it impossible to exercise pub free public reason. The dominance of the markets, and the case of France is really interesting, has weakened civic involvement. And one of the claims of the Gilets Jaunes was that they were not, people were not talking to each other, and they discovered uh, a sense of solidarity, community, sharing um, uh, similar uh, claims together on the roundabout, <laughs> <In, coughs> on the streets. I mean, because there, there is not enough, or, or not really, or perhaps the, the civic spaces have been uh, have disappeared, and it's this pri uh, privatization of freedom which is very, very dangerous, I mean, and which, um, so, and the second point here is that not all these freedoms are compatible. So there should be a debate. There should be a public ongoing debate on the worth, the importance of some freedoms against some others. If you put next to them, next to each other, sorry, freedom of religion, Article 10, and right to marry, Article 9, they clash. And how do you uh, balance that? I mean. You need public deliberation. You can't leave that to the state. It's impossible. You need justificatory processes that establish the priority of some liberties of others. And also, the, the importance of this process to transform the perception of people of what freedom means. I mean, the educational value of public discussion, the transformative value of public discussion, all that is uh, at risk. So, uh, 
so that's my second point, which I could develop, but... And my third criticism is uh, the, the empty universalism of, uh, of freedom, the meaning of freedoms. Um, it's, uh, I, I'm not familiar, I mean, I, I'm not an expert, but I have a feeling that um, the connection between the philosophy of the 1948 Declaration, Universal Declaration, and the Charter is not clear. I mean, does the European Charter see itself as universal in the sense of the 1948 Declaration or not? Where does the European in the European Charter stand? This was, of course, the contradiction that made the agreement on the, Maastricht, uh, on the European Constitution impossible in the Maastricht, Maastricht Treaty. Sorry. Making freedoms uh, in that vague and very general sense a fundamental right is to go against some national cultures and traditions and to aim at dissolving national identities into, into an abstract European model, which is increasingly rejected and has fed, has, uh, fed nationalistic retreat. Uh, I remember the, the uh, negative publicity, I was shocked, uh, at the time of the Human Rights Act in Britain. Uh, it, I mean, the reaction was really horrendous. And I thought it was progress, it meant a lot, no, no, not at all, because uh, we were imposing European values on a country which was the mother of uh, basic rights. So people, I mean, lots of people in Britain thought that it was really extreme to see this Europe which had been ravaged by uh, nad fascism, Nazism, etc., uh, wanting to impose their values on, on Britain. So it was... <coughs> So I'm, I'm worried about this, um, uh, the, the, the extent of uh, this charter. I mean, does it rule Europe? Does it rule the influx of foreigners into Europe, migrants, etc.? I mean, is it universal? I mean, you can have a universal understanding of uh, freedoms as long as it is pluralistic. That's the main thing. It's not one size fits all. It has to be pluralistic. And each country has different tradition, different histories, and they could contribute as long as their visions are respected, discussed in a public sphere. And again, that uh, connects with my uh, criticism that there's no European public sphere. There should be one, but I don't think it exists. I mean. A bit, I mean, there are bits and pieces, certainly, but it's not vibrant, it's not active. <coughs> and one would have hoped, following Mill, that pluralism would have come to progress and weaken nationalism through the effects of freedom of movement, mobility, contacts, and interdependencies, but this has not been the case. And the issue of a polyethnic uh, European demos in the sense of Habermas is still unsolved. So, and the case of freedom of religion is striking because, again, you have a, an example here of the divide that still exists among uh, conception of toleration in Catholic countries and Protestant countries, with the French version being an extreme version of, of that. So, how do uh, people react to this universal or international or transnational uh, understanding of freedom that you have in the Charter. So should uh, European identity be understood in cosmopolitan terms or in terms of so-called European values with the risk of some nations, religions, culture hijacking the European dim dimension as Christian, etc., or white, etc. So, to conclude uh, quickly, but it's a longer part of my paper, but never mind, um, I would like to offer an alternative, freedom based moral compass to this um, in con sorry, a moral com compass. The, following uh, Kant, 
Rawls and Amartya Sen. Now, if we turn to Kant, we all know that what makes persons and on, in themselves and not simply means is their capacity to set the capacity to set ourselves ends and aims to construct plans of life. Kant talks about the capacity to synthesize our various experiences in time into a meaningful, meaningful whole. And that's the understanding of um, the, what it means to be an end or to be uh, unconditionally valuable. It's a capaci the capacity to set ends. We, uh, I quote Christine Kortgaard here, we must regard ourselves, what does it mean that we, are, um, uh, we see ourselves as end in ourselves? We must regard ourselves as capable of conferring value upon the objects of our choice the ends that we set, because we must regard our ends as good. So there is this connection between agency and the good, which is um, at the heart of what, uh, the meaning of freedom. So that's the, the first point I could, de I could develop. The second uh, example I take is, I te is from Rawls and the idea of a plan of life. The, the main contrast between Rawls and the utilitarians is really that uh, for them, uh, human interests are fixed. We take people at one moment in time, we, we look at what they need, and we will provide. Whereas for Rawls, the ability to, uh, to uh, envisage a plan of life, to organize your interest and your preference and your desire in a, into a coherent um, series, I mean, and that's what defined really a free agent. Uh, the ability to organize through time, your, uh, to rank your desires, preferences, and to have another uh, writing uh, objective, that's really what it means to be a free agent. So, the idea of a long-term plan of life. And that's the main point of freedom. Yeah. Why is freedom desirable? Because it gives meaning to your life instead of the meaning be, being given, given by others, being imposed of you. So a human life lived according to a plan, that's what makes us not a thing but a person. So, We are responsible to ourselves, say Rose, as one person of our time for our future, future self and the interest of others. The principle of responsibility to self resemb resembles a principle of right. So, uh, I, I mean, uh, I have a book in a, <laughs> a project uh, writing at the moment on self-development, on the idea of a free agent as an agent that develops through time and also through uh, the, the, connect, the interaction with others, I mean, and solidarity. So really this idea of uh, the temporal dimension, the projection into a future and, uh, an horizon, for me, is central in the idea of freedom. And uh, I'll connect that with Amartya Sen capabilities. Uh, Sen has tried to um, make freedom part and parcel of human well-being. That's really the big uh, renovation, the, the, the big thing in um, his uh, conceptions. He rejects the extremely limited understanding of reason and rationality in favor of a distinction, on the one hand, between having reason to choose something as a capacity to project ends in a temporal horizon, and on the other hand, what would be rational for us to choose at one moment in time? So short, let's say short-term rationality versus projection into uh, having reasons, not causes, but reason to choose something. The main argument for real freedom is the ability to sustain the choice after scrutiny, that is the time-relevant conception of rationality. 
the process of choice itself, he says, is significant and individual advantage is judged, is judged sorry, in terms of the person's capability to do things she has reason to value. So that's really the, 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 the heart of the concept. Capability to do the things she has reason to value. So you have the moral assessment, you have the moral content, you have the agency, and you have also uh, the long-term projection, the reasons. The capability approach focuses on human life and not just on some detached object of conveniences, such as incomes or commodities that the person may possess. So I think that's really would be an alternative uh, to the conception of freedom which I described. I mean, uh, treating the human person as active, as an agent, and able of projecting herself through time towards um, a temporal horizon which is open. And that's what people really claim. I mean, that's what they want. They want opportunities, possibilities, choices over time, I mean, and not simply um, receiving uh, benefits or goods that are uh, necessary uh, for their needs. So maybe my contrast is too stark between a description of human beings based on needs and a description based on ends and aims. But that's really the contrast I wanted to stress. Thank you very much. Thank you to Professor Adar for this critical reading of, the notion of, of basic freedoms in the Charter. Now we will leave the floor to Professor Wiesabai. Yes, thanks a lot for this very interesting paper and thanks a lot to Alessandra and Nicola for giving me the opportunity to, to comment on uh, Katrin Odar's um, paper. Um, and also now while kind of listening after having read the, the paper um, kind of two times, three times, um, kind of now listening again to it, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering exactly kind of where I diverge. And I'm not sure, uh, but maybe we can also have this in the discussion, if the difference, I mean, the difference is certainly philosophical in some respects, um, but to make it very polemical, I would probably say it's the old left, whether the new left uh, that is somehow discussing Europe, uh, um, yeah, and we briefly, Philip and I, we briefly had a discussion about welfare state and migration, and I'm wondering if, if that's not kind of the, the real difference I kind of detect somehow in there, a right? defense of the kind of, kind of the, the, the social democratic project of building a welfare state in one nation, and a more kind of cosmopolitan kind of alternative post-welfare statist left. But maybe that, that's just kind of now listening to the anti-cosmopolitanism uh, in, in your paper. Okay, so, but uh, let me kind of present my comment here. In her presentation, uh, Katrin points out that we do not find one understanding or concept of freedom in the founding documents of the European Union. Uh, references to freedom are used for different purposes, and these references also point into different directions and might thus even be contradictory. This is more in the previous stage, now you kind of just focused on the four uh, freedoms there. Uh, given this, she does not attempt to provide a coherent and plausible view of freedom as we can find it in European law, but she turns to the philosophical debate to develop a concept of freedom which could serve as a heuristic tool to approach questions on freedom in the European context. She acknowledges that there's also no unified view of freedom in the philosophical discussion and advocates herself a complex view of freedom this means of at least four dimensions, opposing the four freedoms, uh, constituting freedom. Essentially, this leads her to equating freedom with, I would now say, significant or real agency. Um, at the end of her paper, she turns to Europe again and uses her complex view of freedom to criticize two narrow or utilitarian approaches to understanding the European project and um, kind of make some kind of counter suggestions. So I agree with Katharine Odin in her broad view of the conditions of, not the broad view of the desirable conditions of human agency, and I also agree with the criticism on a view of Europe as primarily a project promoting economic or general well-being. But I have the impression that she overreaches in her criticism 
when she identifies it with a battle over the concept or conception, and I was thinking that Ian Carter is sometimes here, so I was pointing out that there is obviously a debate on concept and conception, but I will only use concept here now and make it, leave it open if it's a debate about concept or conception. Um, and so kind of, it seems to me that she's kind of putting all the debate, and this is very similar to the, to the question I already asked uh, this morning um, after um, the second uh, talk, the human dignity talk, uh, that she's putting everything into the freedom question. Um, and this will be kind of the main focus of my criticism now, so I will have two objections regarding the concept of freedom, and then I will end with some thoughts on the role of freedom in thinking about migration. So my first objection relates to Katrin's complex view of freedom equating it with real agency. The advantage of such a complex view is obvious. It circumvents seemingly counterintuitive implications we all know from the philosophical debate. Why should we call the person in a wheelchair free to run the 100 meter dash if simply nobody would stop her from participating in the race, which is her agency dimension? Why should we call the ideologically deluded person free who can kill others and aims at doing so if she has been manipulated into believing that this secures the glory of her own group, which points to the value dimension, if I understand it rightly? Why should we call the dissident free who could at any point be imprisoned by those who are ruling, which would be the politics and the law dimension? And finally, why should we call somebody free to form an association if nobody else is interested in such an association, which would be the social dimensions? These examples, which, as I said, we are all familiar with from philosophical discussions, clearly show that in our everyday use, of the terms freedom or free refer to quite different aspects or situations or states, and that most concepts of freedom that have been put forward in the philosophical discussion cannot capture these diverse aspects. But the disadvantage of an approach combining all these dimensions into one concept of freedom is also immediately obvious. The concept of freedom becomes so complex that pointing to the unfreedom of an agent, or even to designate freedom as an aim, is, I would say, analytically not very helpful. It could mean so many different things that we would need much further explication involving other concepts than freedom. And it seems to me that Catherine's and, Catherine's and I guess also many others' main reason for such a complex conception of freedom is not related to the freedom concept, but it's critical. It is supposed to show the limits of assuming that absent interference, immoral or unreasonable values, missing political or legal structures, or missing solidarity are separately sufficient for freedom. The perspective is thus a criticism of two limited appreciations of states, agents, and structures. Katrin seems to assume that if we said the person in the wheelchair was free to run the 100 meter dash, this would somehow imply that this is all what is morally, politically, or legally relevant with re respect to this person. But I don't exactly understand why this should be the case. Why couldn't we say that she is indeed free to run the dash, but that she lacks relevant capacities to run it? If we would want her to be able to run the dash, we must thus provide her, in addition to freedom, with relevant capacities or means to supplement her missing capacities. So this could sound primarily like a terminological question if we call the complex or the single component freedom, but calling some component freedom would allow us to point to some specific feature of the situation. If she is not free to run, this means if handicapped persons are excluded from participating, or does she lack the capacity to do so? This means did she forget her leg prosthesis? So already for the sake of clarity of what we are talking about, I would prefer a more limited and specific concept of freedom. But, second point, I would not only prefer such a more specific concept for the sake of analytic clarity, I would also argue that conceiving of freedom as a complex of properties, capacities, relationships, and legal and political dimensions conceals important normative differences between claims an agent might raise with regard to all of these. Re referring to Kant, Katerin conceives of complex freedom, agency, or autonomy, which all seem to be synonymous to her, as an end. European law and the European political structure should thus provide the means for agents to be able or to achieve to be an end in themselves. I think this is a misunderstanding of Kant. 
And also beyond the Kant philology, philology, normatively it is not convincing. Kant's talk of human beings as ends in themselves refers to their ability to set themselves the norms or maxims which are directing their actions. I don't see that this refers to real freedom in the sense of actions they are really able to perform. I admit that in Kant's doctrine of virtue, at the very end, some interesting teleological perspective comes into play, which, rightly, not rightly, which is right to point out that many do not acknowledge. But this perspective is ethical and not political or legal. And if the virtues in question are absent, this does not affect human beings being ends in themselves. So kind of here we could discuss more on Kant, but I, I'm, I'm very surprised about this teleological reading of Kant uh, here. But more importantly, beyond Kant, I'm not convinced by the normative perspective. If I understand Katrin well, her complex idea of freedom is supposed to show that the EU cannot and should not limit itself to the provision of primarily economic freedoms or liberties which serve the interests of European citizens or some European citizens. It should also consider their possibilities of developing and fulfilling such and many other interests, especially also in cooperation with others. Realizing complex freedom would allow Europeans to relate to their agency and to the things they would really want to do. As I've indicated before, I agree that a broader agenda for the European project is certainly desirable. But in my, I hope, Kantian view, combining this right insight into what would be desirable with the concept of freedom would risk turning the whole idea into something highly problematic. One could understand it to play off the teleological concept of freedom against a procedural, primarily relational, or maybe best, status concept of freedom, which, which I would want to defend. Would it be permissible to limit democratic participation or the rule of law to pursue complex freedom? If not, what, I would argue, then freedom has a means meaning which cannot be overridden by any ends. If we strongly desire a broader set of capacities, social relationships, etc., but we can only achieve this broader set by depriving some of normative authority, the status of co-citizens, it is, in my view, inadmissible to pursue this broader set. I do not want to argue that there will necessarily be contradictions. I rather hope that we will be able to arrive at a broader set, at the broader set with, with democratic means and with the rule of law. But the possibility to distinguish the two options shows that there is an important normative difference. And to refer to a discussion that is in mind with Philip Pettit, but also others have made similar suggestions, I would argue that freedom is the opposite to unfreedom, slavery as the main case, while justice contributes to overcoming non-freedom or equalizing liberties. And freedom has always, I would argue, priority over justice. And here, kind of the terminological distinction becomes normatively relevant. So let me very briefly conclude by relating this to the migration challenge Europe currently faces. Katrin, I would think, primarily focuses on the economic priorities of the European Union and advocates her complex freedom against the narrowness of the economic view or focus. I don't know how she would relate this focus to current debates about European migration policy. You briefly started now in the talk, and maybe you can ex kind of expand a little on, the, on it. If one shifts, I would argue, the focus from the economic focus to migration, I would argue it becomes even more important to stress a status co concept of freedom. It makes a huge difference if we conceive of the migration or refugee challenge as the question how Europe could provide whom with complex freedom, or as the question how Europe cannot dominate or illeg illegitimately rule over people who do not have European citizenship. The way migration is currently discussed in U Europe, I would argue, reifies migrants and turns them into objects of European policy and decisions without acknowledging their normative authority and without any attempt to justify European policy to them. Again, it would obviously be highly desirable to provide migrants with access to education, professional options, possibilities to engage in meaningful social contexts, etc. But to me, this is clearly secondary at the moment where Europe conceives of itself as being allowed 
to establish borders, controls, and many forms of violence, thereby exercising coercion over migrants and refugees without granting them any possibility to contest these measures politically or legally. So one should view this migration policy in light of the general legal and political transformations of the last two decades, uh, the war on terror, I would say, and then it shows to me a general tendency to deny certain persons their legal and political state status. So in this respect, that's maybe the, also the political difference in the background, for me, freedom in Europe is most importantly uh, kind of a term that we should use to criticize these developments and not so much the economic uh, dimension. Okay, thank you. First, for uh, stressing that I have uh, moved towards a more perfectionist view of freedom, of course. I mean, uh, uh, theological, I'm not sure, but perfectionist, certainly, that um, the idea of a meaningful life, I mean, is perfectionist, of course. And um, I mean, it's really the balance between uh, uh, having a conception of the good as absolutely central for a free agent and having a sense of justice. So it's the balance between values and norms, the distinction between values and norms and, uh, and the balance between the two. And uh, I'm not convinced that you can really separate one from the other in your understanding of autonomy. I, I know autonomy means uh, setting rules and norms, but to what? Yeah? L limits and, uh, and rules to what? To a conception of the good. So I, I wouldn't be uh, as strict in my interpretation of Kant as, as you are, but that's open for discussion. But uh, thank you for stressing this, uh, <coughs> this aspect. So now let's, let's go back to the person in the wheelchair. You remember Descartes said, um, we are not unfree because we can't um, fly like a bird. That's the usual, I mean, example. The person in the wheelchair is unfree. No, she's unable to move properly, but she's not unfree. I mean, that's a, okay. But uh, if you start looking at a temporal dimension, so she could see herself as handicapped, as limited, but also project herself into a, a situation where she gets the necessary help to uh, fulfill her dream and, uh, and realize it more or less. I mean, think of the Paralympics, for instance, I mean, etc. And also the, all the research uh, going into handicap, I mean, physical handicap. So um, you can say she is unfree, of course, and freedom has no meaning in that case, but also look at her project. Look at her conception of the good, if you want. So you see, it's different. Uh, so, um, economic conditions are uh, absolutely essential to fund uh, her project, her, her self-realization, etc. But you need that first, I mean, the input. And um, so I, I was struck, I was watching an absolutely amazing film, I'm sure you are familiar with it, by Edgar Heitz called The Andere Heimat, uh, which is a prequel to Heimat, the famous uh, German series. And in that uh, film, you have um, the case of migration, because this is the story of German peasants from the 1840s migrating to Brazil. And uh, one of the sons in the family is learning, because he found a book by chance, he's learning the language of uh, Indian pop native populations in, in Brazil. And he is absolutely dreaming, that's his dream, to go to Brazil. Not for economic reasons only, but also because he wants to communicate with this extraordinary culture he has discovered. And his brother, has no interest whatsoever, but managed in the end to go to Brazil on a, on a program of migration. And the, the son who is interested, really interested in Brazil can't go. So you have this contrast between economic forces and needs on the one hand, 
and on the other hand, you have this vision of someone who is shaping his identity, his future, his values, himself, and can't realize them. You, you see the, the contrast, I mean. So, uh, so the person in the wheelchair can be animated by something which will overcome her difficulties. I mean, that's, that's the, my understanding, if you want. Second point, my uh, response, I think it's a misunderstanding because you seem to think that um, complex freedom would exclude uh, co citizens' rights. Not at all. I mean, I'm never had that in, in, uh, in my longer paper. I show, in the contrary, how a developmental conception of the person, of a sort I'm advocating, is conditioned on solidarity and the, particip the cooperation of others. So you can't realize your, yourself or your, you can't develop yourself without, of course, uh, the, the social, I mean, the cultural and social dimension. Think of solidarity in the sense of uh, French solidarism, bourgeois, etc. Now, uh, the other thing I was not completely happy with is your distinction between freedom as means and freedoms as aim. I'm not clear about that. Um, if freedom is, con is a certain type of agency, uh, it's not conditioned on aims, it's conditioned on, on uh, means, of course, uh, but the ends you, sh you choose. I mean, freedom is not, not, not an end in itself. I mean, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, because it is um, a form of agency where you realize yourself, so it's connected with uh, well-being, happiness, uh, self-realization, etc. But it's not a, an end. I mean, I was not clear about that. Um, it's the ability to set ends which is different, but not. Um, now, my main uh, disagreement with you would be on uh, freedom as a status, because again, status is there. And I'm thinking in terms of development. So I can't really be satisfied with a legal status. I mean, it's important. It's absolutely a, con a necessary condition secu for security. And liberty and security are closely uh, entwined. But um, a status is not enough. Okay? Uh, it, unless you, it's a launching pad, if you want, which opens possibilities. But it gives security, it's essential, but uh, it's instrumental for freedom, it's not constitutive. That's, that's what my uh, response would be. Okay, so I, I will stick for a complex, rich of your freedom. <coughs> So thank you, thank you for your presentation. That was uh, a great interest for me. Uh, can't see. Well, I, I you, you hear me? Uh, no, I can't see you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I thought the voice was coming from the back. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, well, perhaps some clarification. But before that, uh, I would, en passant, uh, say something to Professor Niederberger uh, about Kant. That's uh, a nice dispute, I believe. It's a dispute, after all. But uh, about what? So agency is there in Kant, or is it different conceptions of liberty, etc. Well, the, we have some uh, indicia in Kant about uh, the version that uh, Professor Odard um, endorses. That is, uh, well, what would you say about we cannot uh, be ruled under a law that we did not contribute to make? 
for example, that is also a line to Rousseau. Uh, what would you say about uh, the rejection by Kant, I believe so, but you might correct, of paternalism yeah. at agency. Yeah. So the idea that uh, after all goes uh, in, con in connection with uh, Jefferson. When uh, Professor Zanetti was quoted uh, the Declaration of Independence, uh, at the end of that passage there was uh, the right to the pursuit of happiness, not the right to happiness. That's a different thing, because you know, if you have a right to happiness, I can decide what you have to do to be happy. But the point here is different. The point is that you are an agent, a free agent, and you have to choose your way to happiness. This is very important in the liberal perspective of the matter. Anyway, that's just about Kant. So we have some indicia that we can discuss the point. I'm not saying that I'm right, or that, but it's, uh, it's a point. Instead, for Professor Odard, well, uh, it's impressive how you do this, how you re-elaborate freedoms that are the liberal part of our conceptual universe in, yeah, in a perfectionist uh, mode. Uh, and also, in, uh, for me, a bit provoking. Sorry? For me, a bit provoking. Uh, well, okay, I understand that uh, freedom uh, is the premise for the pursuit of the good. That's your thesis and I agree with that. Of course it is for the individual. It's clear, it's impossible, <laughs> the pursuit of the good, if you are not free to do so. So this is the point on which we agree. But then, when the matter comes to the collective problem of the freedoms of the individual in a polity, then things are different. Because one thing is that I leave you free to make your choices. Another thing is that I decide what is the good for the collectivity. Mm -hmm. This is a contradiction with the first assumption we made. Anyway, in that case of the polity, you say freedoms should be considered to be strongly connected with the, the structure of solidarity. And again, of course, one thing is freedom, another thing is that you can impose solidarity or some... Well, it all depends on the definition of what we mean with solidarity. There is maybe, I don't know if it is a matter of degree, we will see tomorrow. <laughs> but uh, in principle, uh, let's not take this as a matter of degree, otherwise it's too easy you know, to, um, to avoid the problem. Let's say that solidarity is solidarity, is very close to beneficiality, is something different from uh, reciprocity. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something different from reciprocity. Yeah, okay. It's something different from some minimal associative obligation that are necessary. It's different from uh, coherence. Solidarity is, uh, is something more. And so, unless we have a, a, a definition of solidarity that is compatible with this uh, inferior level of commitment, uh, well, we will see. Otherwise, uh, it is a bit at odds with uh, the point of freedom that I would share. But then, uh, if we stick to solidarity, we imbue freedom with uh, something that makes us stepping from morality, that is, the, I believe, the realm of freedoms, towards ethics. That is... Well, this is something Rawlsian in this distinction, so I hope you agree with that. Ethics is the choice of the good. Uh, it's not just respect for justice and respect for the private sphere of others. So freedoms might be connected with this 
morality idea uh, and with the capacity to choose for the good, but you cannot impose a conception of the good. So the question becomes, why do you think at the end that we can impose to Europe such a conception of the good based on freedom uh, through solidarity and solidarity through freedoms? This is a, a comprehensive conception. Well, perfectionist, but it's a comprehensive conception in the Rawlsian sense. Mm -hmm. But if it is a comprehensive conception that we wish to impose to all over the member states of Europe, <laughs> it's a bit paternalistic. It's anti-freedom by definition. I mean, it, it, I will do that. But what about, yeah, the British who did sign the European Convention on Human Rights 1950 only in 1998, 48 years later, and you stressed that mm -hmm. point. So it's difficult. Why don't, why don't you uh, suggest for Europe uh, constitutional overlapping in political liberalism of roles? That would be much uh, understandable to the many differences that do populate Europe. But no, you are, you are doing differently. You are pushing towards the connection towards solidarity and, and so forth, so the social idea of Europe that of course we share, that I would like to implement. But I, I am not sure that we will be free to do so if we have a perfectionist idea of Europe. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. No, thank you very much for pointing to uh, the <coughs> upon the upon sim seeming uh, dangers of uh, an alternative uh, what I call an alternative moral compass to what's going on at the moment. I mean, uh, well, I was uh, speaking in my own name, I mean, as a reaction to what's happening at the moment, really, um, that we should really uh, take freedom more seriously and have a freedom-based conception of the person. Uh, that's that's the, uh, against the dominance of an economic view of the person. I mean, that was my personal take on the crisis at the moment, really. Um, the, distinction, the distinction, sorry, between political conceptions and comprehensive conceptions is complex because uh, You, the way you present, or the way your uh, moral view are expressed in the public sphere, have, have, uh, they have to be constrained so that they can address really um, uh, the plurality of views and the plurality of moral comprehensive doctrines in a society. But anyway, uh, you, the debate is among comprehensive views of the good. You can't, I mean, that's how it works in democratic society. There is a plurality of views of, of the good. And we have to arbitrate and to uh, try to find consensus, compromises among them in the public sphere. And so that in the end, we reach an agreement on, on common rules and norms, etc. But you can't um, uh, empty or the, the, the content of, of these various conceptions of the good. You see what I mean? I mean, the, the debate is there. You, I mean, Rawls says, as a procedure, in order to reach some kind of stability of, or some, ty some type of compromise, political compromise, you have to put aside your own uh, values, if you want, when you enter the public sphere. But they're there. And in his extended view of, uh, the, of public reasons, he said that we can reach these uh, common uh, norms through ver various avenues which are embedded in your conception of the good. So the contrast is not uh, strict, it's dynamic. It's always uh, uh, the conceptions of the good are feeding into an agreement on justice, for instance. So um, I'm not... Uh, I'm not sure that I'm reverting to a kind of comprehensive liberalism. I don't think so. Uh, but it's, it's a problem. I mean, I agree that uh, you have to 
have a, a flexible view of the divide between the public and the non-public domain. Or, uh, well, that's crucial. Uh, now, your first question on solidarity is very interesting. It's central for my new book, I mean, because uh, I'm trying to fight a view of individualism as excluding solidarity and reciprocity. And if you have, if you uh, use a development, developmental view of, uh, of individuality, then you see that in order to grow and develop, you need all the time the contribution of others, I mean, of uh, culture, society, history, etc., all the time. I mean, so the, the, the contrast I'm drawing is between a static view of the self as the utilitarian view and a dynamic or development view of the self. So then, then solidarity feeds in. It's obvious that uh, to grow a plant needs feeding all the time. That's what we are. Yeah. Yeah. More on solidarity tomorrow morning. <laughs> um, uh, I have a simple-minded uh, question to Catherine. So if I understood you properly, had you uh, been holding the pen when the uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights uh, was written, you would have scrapped the S uh, in freedoms. It would have been Absolutely. freedom to core, and uh, you would have filled that in with a sort of green sand conception of freedom. What would follow, what does follow, for the four freedoms? Would you, uh, the so-called four freedoms, not uh, Roosevelt's, uh, but uh, yeah. the single market uh, four freedoms, uh, would you have scrapped uh, uh, some of them? Would you have restricted maybe three of them? The, freedom of movement for capital, goods, services, and expanded one of them, uh, said uh, it's not just workers and job seekers who can move freely, job seekers for a limited period, but it is citizens who can move whatever their economic situation. So what would follow from you freedom singular uh, for the freedoms plural? Gosh. <laughs> <coughs> Um, it's a big question. Uh, I would regulate. Uh, I think uh, markets are institutions and they need regulation. You can't, I mean, uh, you have to balance really um, the search for prosperity and economic growth with lots of other considerations. So I would, uh, I would defend the market, but within enough regulations, I mean. Um, for instance, I mean, I remember when um, 2004, the, was it um, when lots of people arrived from um, Eastern Europe, Central and Eastern Europe, I mean, there was no moratorium on that. The way there was one for Bulgaria and Romania. We had to wait seven years, I think, or something. Is that right, seven? Until, until they could freely move. We never did that for the pearls, etc. Why? I mean, there was no regulation of freedom of movement at, the, at that time. So, I mean, the shock for Britain has been enormous. I mean, I'm trying to come to terms with the present situation, and it's crucial. So, markets without regulation lead to disasters. That would be my view, but I mean, I can uh, accept objection. <laughs> well, I'm worried about, I mean, free movement of people. Are they free when they flee from dreadful situations, poverty, etc.? What, what do you, I mean, how do you look at that? I mean, I know lots of, uh, I have lots of friends coming from uh, Eastern Central Europe, and I have no sense that they were free really to move. It was a necessity. So, freedom of movement to study, yes, because obviously it seemed to be a free choice and freedom in my sense of projecting into a future, etc., etc. But freedom to flee your own place 
and never go back and be cut off from your families or your culture. So it's horrible. I mean, the people I know, I mean, they suffer a lot. So. <laughs> Hi, thanks for the paper, which I found very interesting. I have actually a clarificatory question and, uh, I don't know, a comment or a strange open question. And the clarification uh, concerns your um, critique of uh, commodification uh, in the sense that, so I see the point and, and, and I do understand, I think I, I understand where you're going to except that I was a bit puzzled about your um, example about Brexit, in the sense that you said, so if I understood it correctly, <laughs> I might get you wrong, but so it seems to me that you said, um, so we had a lot of problem in Britain because, you know, uh, the, the word, the Polish plumber, you know, the, uh, so we, they arrived there and, and, and then uh, there was a problem of uh, how to integrate work-wise those persons. Although it seems to me that then what you needed was more uh, a, a better understanding of workers more than prob of persons within the country. So maybe you want to say that we need to separate the level of the principles of the freedom mm -hmm. and the level of norms applying to workers that then we don't need to have that kind of language at the level of the principle. But isn't this a problem for given your third critique about the empty universalism? Don't you think that your uh, the fact of uh, you know, going more into the rights of the person may be fragile or, or could be you know um, argued against from the perspective that you put yourself about the empty universalism? Mm -hmm. So I was wondering how to yeah. get out of that. How to square uh, anti? Uh, how to square not anti universalism but pluralism? Uh, <laughs> somehow, given the situation. And, and the other question is whether um, uh, invoking uh, the pluralist dimension, the pluralism dimension uh, at this level is actually, could uh, is, is, it kind of commits you to a federalist view of yeah. Europe, mm -hmm. and whether you think that the change in the freedom talk at that level could, could not should or will, but could trigger uh, some a project in that direction. Yeah. Uh, to the second, I mean, the last question, my reply would not be federalism, but um, a European public sphere. I think, I mean, uh, my, in my view, that's really what, what's crucial. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. In order to fight an empty universalism, which is rejected by populations, I mean, they're unacceptable. You have to have a place where uh, contradictions and debates take place, and uh, that's missing. So, I, I mean, federalism um, works well, like uh, any, any, any uh, institutions that can uh, give a voice to minorities, diversity is, Welcome, really. So, yes. Um, now, the first part of your question uh, on workers, I mean, I'm not, could you repeat that? Because I'm not sure I, I got it right. I was wondering whether going back into the language of individual, of freedom of the person instead of freedom of the workers might be taken as a sort of empty universalism mm -hmm. and therefore having some problems. Yeah. Somehow. Okay, no, I, I need to think about it, really. I mean, uh, it's complex. Okay, yes. <coughs> yeah, in, uh, in the analysis of the charter that we do as a uh, unit of Milan uh, in the Nova Migra project, we found that in the section on freedoms, there are some hints suggesting that at least the chart, the European charter, understand freedom in some way, in a way similar to the Amartya Sen conception oh. of freedom. Mm -hmm. Take for instance uh, the, the fact that the charter includes in the section some freedoms the right to education, yeah. which is typically considered a social right, so w which is one of the more striking features of the charter, oh. if, you, if, if you think to that. So that's true that the four Liber freedoms of the European market uh, seems to 
be in opposition to an idea of freedom as the one uh, suggested by Amartya Sen. But in the Charter, I think that the idea of freedom is quite different and more close to what you are suggesting. Yeah. So maybe that's... Uh... <laughs> is that in terms of human capital? I mean, that sort of uh, reasoning that you should invest in education in order to develop your potential and your capacity to earn, etc. I mean, the, all the, the whole tradition of uh, human capital. Yeah, but that's not clear that but it is only this market-oriented yeah. meaning of the right to education yeah. in the Charter. It seems to suggest more the ability to yeah. a criti develop a critical attitude yeah. towards the option that are open to so you. That, and that to would uh, give a sense to freedom of movement for people, because peop they can educate themselves in various parts of Europe, yes. Yeah. No, I was thinking of that, absolutely, that it's the way to um, save the four freedoms, I mean, in that sense of uh, uh, right, to uh, right to education, yes. Yeah. Thank you.